I need your attention for a second. Hey, I need your attention. We're gonna we're gonna take a, a series of photos, and we're gonna start from the bottom step. And I want people to line up according to chapters and branches if you remember them. <laughs> Of course, everybody knows that Huey was a uh, co-founder of the Black Panther Party. He and Bobby met up and uh, were able, through the Social Students Advisory Council at Merritt College, uh, to hammer out the 10-point program and get it presentable. When that happened, um, he asked me to join the party. <laughs> and I was probably the fourth or fifth person to join the party. And I said, wait a minute now, this is called the Black Panther Party. And, you know, I, I, I don't look exactly black. <laughs> Here's what Huey's response was. He said, the struggle for freedom, justice, and equality transcends racial and ethnic barriers. And as far as he was concerned, I was a Black Panther. If you want to ask what is Richard's legacy, most interesting thing I would say is that uh, he created a whole bunch of militant Asians. He, his whole personality was different. Most Asians are on the, what do you call it, quiet side. And here, he, he was so, what's the word? I don't want to say anything that doesn't sound good. I mean, he was... Not that he was loud or anything. I mean, he was, wait, how would you describe Richard Aoki? Well, he, he wasn't a quiet type. He's really, really radical in his politics, and he kind of has this attitude, like, um, I don't give a fuck kind of attitude, and he'll just say whatever, and um, whatever he believes in, he'll kind of go out there and um, make his statements about it. Think of reform like a piece of shit. <laughs> a square piece of shit. Woo! If you take a square piece of shit and you make it a round piece of shit, it's still a piece of shit. I would describe Richard as a, a dedicated revolutionary. Now, those are broad words, but I always found Richard to be uh, consistent in uh, his philosophy, in his actions. It's hard for me to relate to these sample questions that I was provided because some of the questions are beyond my purview. Who was on your original board of directors? I answered to a central committee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. When they spoke and gave the line, I went along. I mean, I was a servant of the people. They said, this needs to be done, even if you risk getting arrested. What can I say? Where did you get your initial funding? I can't comment on that. <laughs> what obstacles did your organization have to overcome? The police. They kept impeding <laughs> our progress. The way that he responds to his environment is without a lot of fear. So when he sees something that he thinks is makes sense to him, is the truth, is the right thing to do, and he's a very principled person. Um, he'll do it, regardless of possible consequences. For Richard, Richard is a walking road map of what he's about, okay? You just have to follow him around. You know, if you just get a video camera and follow him around, you know, it shows you who he is and what he believes. 
if you have not won and you are still breathing, then that means you still have to fight. That means, you know, I mean, I'm, when I get to be 60 years old and I'm 70 years old, and if I'm still breathing, I'm going to be still doing this. And I'm sure that's the way Richard feels. I know he does, you know. I talk to him. I, 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 it's, it's something that generates, it emanates from him. I have a reputation for being direct. I do believe in mass action. Uh, there are other methods of gaining what one wants for the community, but ultimately it comes down to um, power. You don't have any power, you don't have anything. And the only power that people have is people power. I've been a political prisoner several times in my life, and the first time was when I was about three years old. When Japan attacked the United States, everybody who was Japanese in this country, talk about racial profiling, were sent to concentration camps. This was happening in a period before the civil rights movement in that kind of era of massive protest, um, and also because there was so little support for the Japanese very unlike today with the Arab and Muslims where there is support for them and, and against discrimination. There was very little support for the Japanese. There were all these articles in the paper. We got to get the Japs out of here. The Japs are not to be trusted. The only good Japs are dead Japs. The mythology of the concentration camps is that all the Japanese went quietly that they didn't protest, that they were content inside the concentration camps. Um, and I call that mythology. Inside the camps, there was a lot of turmoil and a lot of protest. People were very upset, in particular, about the Japanese American Citizens League and the, the way that they promoted cooperation with the government without really sticking up for the rights of the Japanese at that time. I grew up in a concentration camp. And I remember uh, the first fight I got into was over a candy bar. When you're in a concentration camp, they don't have too many candy bars, so I fought my, for my candy bar hard and broke the guy's nose. We were in the camp, you know, and we were in this desert. We are surrounded by mountains. And as a kid, you're curious, what's, what's out in the mountains? What a bunch of us kids, there was me, my brother, a couple other kids, we found an unguarded part of the fence, slipped underneath the fence and wandered towards the mountains, which really were tens of miles across. We didn't have any water. Our parents noticed we were missing. They reported it to the guards and there was um, a Piper Cub that they had, light playing, that they sent up searching for us and then when they found us, they radioed uh, for a half track. They came, picked us up, and our parents were pretty relieved. We didn't get punished for it, because our parents were more relieved. We were okay, but we were, we were a bunch of unhappy campers by that time. Richard's kind of critical views on the United States and its professed democracy and its professed egalitarian values were shaped inside the concentration camps. I got real excited because I was in kindergarten and in the school pageant, I was chosen to play George Washington <laughs> on a crossing the Delaware. And I ran back to the barracks and I told my father, oh, and guess what, guess what? I'm gonna be George Washington, father of our country in the school pageant, you know. Well, that was one of the first political education lessons that I went through because my father then physically explained to me about wrong thing and bad identity. You gotta know where you come from and where you are. And you gotta know that solidly before you make your move. And there's nothing worse than thinking you're something that you're not. And if you're a member of the oppressed class, you better realize you're a member of the oppressed class and do something about it. I remember sitting in first grade. Dick Jane Dog Spot. Now I'm saying, yeah, Dick Jane Dog Spot. House. I look out the window and I see Barrett. Picket fence. I see barbed wire fence. I said, hey. hey. My friends have told me the reason why they put me in a concentration camp when I was a little boy 
was because they knew I was going to be an enemy of the state when I grew up. And they were going to do, you know, time served. And I said, damn. After Topaz, Utah, um, came back to uh, California, good old California, can't stay away from it, and grew up in West Oakland. And um, as a result of that, got the reputation as the baddest Oriental to come out of West Oakland. It was a black ghetto. He's a homegrown local community leader. It's important to understand that. Uh, he knows the Bay Area, you know, like you know your backyard. I grew up on 26 and Union Street between Dogtown and the Lower Bottom on the outskirts of Ghost Town. He doesn't uh, go to New York or Washington or New Orleans. He doesn't buy sharp suits in Hong Kong or nothing like that. Oakland. Over to the right where this gray building is used to be the family residence of the Aokis from about 1902 to World War II, the building remained in the family, and that's where we relocated after the war. The building across the street was the Oakland Food Products Factory that my grandfather founded and made into a prosperous business. There I was. Uh an Oriental boy growing up in a black neighborhood. But that was probably one of the best experiences I ever had because it gave me uh, an opportunity to be immersed in African American society and learn about the culture, the good and the bad. The town is tight, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I, there's nowhere like Oakland. There, there's nothing anywhere. You can go to some parts in this country and go, oh, yeah, this is kind of like. Oakland isn't like that though. Oakland is unique. And then there's the other side of it where the same things that are unique about Oakland, some of those things are the same things that make Oakland tragic. Our family was so poor, we couldn't pay attention. That's a joke. I played in this park. It was called the Infirmary Park at the time. And there's a recreation center there and I used to play pool and I have good time fun here. Kids growing up, this was very popular recreation uh, spot. I spent many hours in the recreation center playing pool, ping pong, socializing with my fellow hoodies. You notice there's no back door to the recreation center. One night I found out there wasn't a back door when I was cornered on the second floor by a gang that was gonna beat my head in and I had to jump out of one of the windows. Thank God there was grass underneath. I didn't break anything. And once I hit that grass and rolled a couple of times, I was able to chug on down the road. I graduated from Herbert Hoover Junior High School and the last day of class, the school went wild and it was beat every white student on campus day. <laughs> and the principal at McClyman's expected our class that first day and said something to the effect of, he's gonna put the animals in their cages when they get there, which meant my graduating class. <laughs> and so on the first day, and it was the first time in the history of Oakland Unified School District a principal and vice principal got the shit kicked out of them. Um, in the riot, it was alleged there was a little Oriental boy putting the foot to the principal as well. And so I had to leave in a hurry. It always amazed me. We'd drive down the street, he'd point out, People, that's so and so, so and so. Let me tell you about his brother, so and so, so and so, and his cousin. He's doing five for so and so, so and so. I said, wow, man. And people knew Richard. That's the thing that was so impressive. You know, I mean, people you wouldn't expect to know Richard knew Richard. You know, not exactly bums on the corner, but you couldn't tell who knew Richard from the way they looked. You know, he'd go place. People knew Richard. That's impressive. You know. Nobody, what are you doing here? 
Nothing like that. One time, he's an attorney, they threw me in a holding cell with 30 criminals. And when I got in that cell, I figured I'm gonna have to, you know, duke it out with 30 dudes in there. Then I heard somebody say, hey Richard, what's happening? I turned around and there was Tiny. Now if you've ever been in jail, Anybody called Tiny, you don't want to mess with. He was the biggest man in the cell. And I remember we grew up in West Oakland. I said, oh, Tiny, Tiny, Tiny. Hey, man, this, I'm, I'm in trouble now. And so he turned around and he said, I want to introduce all you people to my friend Richard. And I got real close to him. Yes, indeed. We, we, we buddies here. And again, I think that's another pivotal location. This is probably one of the most pivotal locations for Richard's development and his um, social development of his social consciousness, his racial identity, and his later political um, consciousness and activism. A lot of people are kind of unaware of it, but Oakland was sort of like Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Gary all wrapped up into one. And out of the material conditions comes the consciousness of the proletarian. We workers, we get screwed by the boss. <laughs> The class struggle is very, has always been a part of West Oakland history. You have to remember during that period of time, residential segregation was still the law of the land. And that experience, that immersion in black culture, opened my eyes to other injustices done to other people. We were living in housing conditions that feds even condemned. I saw that in some census tract report one time. Uh, the schools, of course, were the worst in, in Oakland, as they still are in the ghetto. There were no medical or health facilities in West Oakland. There wasn't even a single doctor's office there. So. I also then ran into the Oakland Police Department. Now, the Oakland Police Department is the only police department in the history of this state that was put into receivership by the State Attorney General's office in 1946 for brutality and corruption, and righteously so. It was rumored that the Oakland Police Department used to send their recruiters to the Deep South to recruit white policemen to work here in Oakland to beat black heads. I was a witness to all the abuses and the atrocities committed by the Oakland Police Department during the 40s and 50s and 60s. I was about eight or nine years old, hanging out in the streets, hanging out in the corner, you know. And this drunk, everybody in the neighborhood knew he was a harmless drunk, comes stumbling out of the bar, runs into two white Oakland cops, and they hassle him, and he throws up. But he got some of his uh, emesis on the uniform of one of the cops. And they beat him half to death. And nobody did a thing. Beat him half to death. They pulled the Rodney King on him. But nobody said they were. Because that's the way it was. Not the way it should have been, but that's the way it was. In retrospect, I probably wouldn't have been so politically sensitive and active if I hadn't grown up in that particular environment. Because that 10 years I spent were the formative years uh, of my life and exposed me uh, to the um, uh, racism, the segregation, the oppression, the um, exploitation of people of color. And I could easily see the similarities between the concentration camp experience and um, the conditions in the West Oakland uh, ghetto. I was given the chance that every ethnic minority male at that time was given the chance to do, to serve the country. <laughs> and I enlisted in the United States Army. He joined the U.S. military when he was young. Everybody went into the, when I, you know, Richard is about five years older than me. But I remember everybody went into the military, unless you were brave and went to college. I signed up for you. I don't sell me short. I said, hey, I'm bad. I'm from West Oakland. Hey, I'm going to kill me a commie for Christ. That's how good it is. 
So it's obvious he just went from one gang to the other. That's obvious to me. The one gang was when he was growing up. The other gang was the military. Uh, 17. I, I, that, was, that was my American dream. To be the youngest, to be the first Japanese American general in the history of the United States Army. Towards the last year of my uh, uh, service, I began to get nervous about the war in Vietnam. It was starting to pick up and uh, I started talking with uh, my buddies who had been over there and had come back and they were telling me the truth about what was happening over there. I began to develop a moral aversion to the war. I don't mind going out and killing other people. I mean, if they're going to try and kill me, I've got to kill them. But women and children, that's a different story. And that's when ethical questions come up. You know, well, if somebody's going mano a mano, yeah, bring it on with your AK-47. But I don't believe in going through villages and, you know, shooting down men, women, children, dogs. And that's what was happening over there. So rather than, you know, jump up and say, I refuse, and there were a lot of GIs doing that, and there were a lot of court martials too. I just kept my mouth shut until my enlistment ran out after eight years. And then um, midnight of my last night, uh, I went to the regimental headquarters to get my muster out stuff. And I walk in there and I sign the papers to get out. I'm free, free at last, free at last. And the clerk puts another sheet of paper and said, eight more years. I said, would you mean eight more years? The colonel, he said, told me, you're a live wire. We've been watching you. You've been promoted, you've been doing good, you know, you, you're great. I said, well, that's fine, but I'm leaving. The colonel would call out of his bed in the middle of the night to talk with me. Wanted to find out if I was mentally ill or anything because I wasn't signing back up. If somebody had signed up for eight years, it's almost automatic they'll probably sign up for another eight. That's 16, four more, that's 20 years, you're likely to cook. Well, in the midnight conversation we had, he wanted me to reenlist. <coughs> he offered me $3,500 in cash. In the barracks, we used to call that blood money re-enlistment bonus. And I think that probably I made one of the wisest career moves I ever made. I just kept on walking. About that time I got to meet some people who are the, what we would call, old left. Communists, Trotskyites, Social Democrats. Primarily in the union movement because I started getting involved in labor struggle and um, uh, I began reading a lot. And I started reading uh, Marx and Lenin, you know, the, the whole, the, the orthodox Marxist. But I'm bringing it up to date real fast because there are a lot of things happening in the world. Internationally, there is a whole movement against um, colonialism, against imperialism, and for national liberation. And many countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and the Caribbean begin to gain their at least formal sense of, of, of national liberation. And in the United States, we see some parallel movements happening, first with the civil rights movement, and then it turns in the mid-60s into this much more militant black power movement. Student revolts were taking place all over the world, Prague, Mexico, Paris, Berkeley. And national liberation wars in third world countries we're all going full gun. There were revolutions or wars of national liberation led by Ahmed Ben Bella in Algeria, Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, Nelson Mandela in South Africa, in Latin America, the Sandinistas, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, and in the East, Ho Chi Minh, leader of the Vietnamese people, Kim Il-sung, leader of the Korean people, and Mao Zedong. In fact, we had a saying in those days, the East is red and the West is red. He, he becomes politically conscious and very quickly radicalized. And it's interesting how quick Richard becomes radical. 
um, in, a, in a period in which most people are gravitating towards the more moderate civil rights movement. In 64, I decided to go to college. And so I went to Merritt College and I ran into Huey. Well, I knew the Newton family because we grew up in the same neighborhood. And Huey impressed me from the very first time I met him. Uh, he was a tough dude. Yeah, I knew Huey was bad the time we went to Stubby's pool hall and we got into it with a half dozen dudes in that pool hall. He was fast. I was stunned. At that time, he and I were both running the streets being little wannabe thugs, <laughs> drinking that wine, and he said, hey, let's go down to Stubby, you know. I said, oh, we're going to get in trouble. Oh, no. So we go down to Stubby's, and he starts playing the dozens with one of the dudes, and I said, shit, we're going to get in trouble. And they started hooking, and I said, oh, Lord. Everything was cool until somebody else tried to jump in. Then I had to jump in because I was watching his back. Then the other dudes jumped in. And so we fought our way outside, and one of Huey's relatives happened to be driving by, saw us out in the sidewalk in the streets fighting with the half dozen dudes. And the guy reached in the glove compartment, pulled the gun out, I think it was a 32, popped around in the air, and we were able to make our escape on that one, and later it was one of these. Look at what you got us into, man. Yeah, we're going down there just to have a little, shoot a little pool there. We end up fighting everybody in the, in the place. Huey was also a very compassionate person. Uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, OD on uh, uh, acid and was having a bad trip and wanted to turn himself into the uh, hospital, but we knew that at that time under the drug laws, had he showed up at the hospital, they wouldn't have treated him, he would have been arrested. Uh, so uh, Huey and I helped the guy come down from his bad trip, and he, I remember Huey kept saying, hang in there, man, hang in there, you know, uh, uh, everything will be cool. I was like, practically freaking out, man. This acid shit. <laughs> Heavy duty drug and stuff, man. It ain't my cup of tea. But, but Huey and I spent the night <laughs> saying, you know, cool it, man. Cool it. You'll get better. And Huey took the lead on that, uh, showing that he understood what was happening and trying to reassure the brother he wasn't going to die. <laughs> Felt like it, but he wasn't going to die. And uh, the brother recovered. He later joined the Black Panther Party when it was started. The Huey I knew, okay, was a big head that he was really a humble uh, person. Actually, uh, Huey Newton introduced me to Richard Aoki uh, at Merritt College. Some of the most brilliant African-American youngsters became students here. Among them, Bobby Seale, Huey Newton, Marvin Jackman, later Marvin, now Marvin X, and a whole host of uh, Maurice Dawson, I think, and um, a lot of what we call, or Du Bois would call the talented tent. Now, that's one half of the puzzle. The other half was the faculty. When this became a community college, the Oakland Unified School District supplied some of the best instructors for the faculty. In addition to drawing in graduates from Berkeley to teach here. So it had a fine faculty um, albeit highly gender confused, but beside that, they were good. When you got this faculty with this student body and the prevalent political movement of the time, the nationalist movement, you got a mixture that was dynamite.
I remember one time there in that period, I got extremely interested in um, problems with Africa. And, you know, I became well-read and listening to Richard and working with, well, I wasn't directly working with him so much as that he was just a buddy and a friend who really was quite astute, you know, on a lot of world events and things. Um, with Huey, it was Huey and Richard who really dealt on a intellectual, uh, not so much debate basis, but uh, a lot of conversation philosophically and stuff like this here. What struck me about Huey was his intellect. He could take abstract, complex uh, theoretical stuff brilliant. and and brilliant is the brilliant. only word uh, I could I could use to describe how he was able uh, to do all this stuff. And I said, man, you know, he was an intellectual heavyweight. Is the best I could describe him in that right. area. I agree. Uh, black people are uh, treated very much as uh, the Vietnamese people or any other colonized people because we're used, we're brutalized, the police in our community occupy uh, our uh, area, our community as a foreign troop occupies territory and the police are there not to, uh, in our community, not to uh, promote our welfare or uh, for our security and our safety, but they're there to contain us, uh, to uh, brutalize us and murder us uh, because they have their orders uh, to do so. And um, just as the soldiers in Vietnam have their orders to uh, destroy the Vietnamese people, uh, the, the uh, police in our community couldn't possibly be there uh, to uh, protect our property because we own no property. Richard had an apartment. We'd pop over there sometimes, sit up, drink some wine, eat cheese. And I didn't care for wine much, so I'd buy me some beer. And, um, but his reputation around campus that, you know, he was just an involved kind of guy who knew all the organizational groups, who knew everybody, and, uh, you know, he got into various kinds of debates with people about issues, uh, not only worldly issues and other stuff, but even the civil rights issues of the day at that time. Richard was right there in the middle of uh, the arguments and the debates on campus. I was the head of the Socialist Discussion Club, and Bobby was head of the Soul Students Advisory Council. And we used to get to get, have emissaries go from one group to the other. I would go and meet with Soul Students Advisory Council. Um, I'd invite Bobby to the socialist discussion clubs where I would have Marxists. Leninists speak about socialism. Um, across the street where you see these new houses, there used to be black-owned businesses like restaurants, barber shops, things like that, you know, kind of community-based businesses. And we would meet over there. These BART tracks weren't constructed until the 70s. So, um, Merritt had about 10 to 12,000 students at that time and a large portion of it was um, African American, Asian American. Me, Huey, and Richard had consulted on the up two upcoming marches, uh, anti-Vietnam marches, peaceful protests. In one particular one, the one that came down, came down Adeline to Stanford Street, this march had been set up coming from University of California, 10 or 15 blocks up north, down to the city limits, and they were stopped. The march was stopped by 200 policemen. But they opened ranks and let the oncoming 40 or 50 Hell's Angels riding these bikes, these motorcycles, and let them plow in to the peaceful demonstrators who had been stopped at the Berkeley, Oakland City limits, Oakland City, Berkeley City limits. Now, then the police waded in and brutalized quite a few people in the peaceful protest group. 
The anti-war protest really is key and our attitude towards the police beating up the anti-war protesters, you know, it's all connected. And Richard being the key person that involves Huey and I really into the anti-war protest marches. So while we already knew about police brutality in the black community, that's one thing, right? But if you want to protest for civil rights, if you want to protest, you know, uh, the brutality that the police are meeting out on the peaceful protesters' heads, boom, how do you do this? Malcolm X was telling us about uh, defending ourselves, defending our community. So as Huey and I were doing our research in the political stuff and getting involved, we read things by Fran Fanon and uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, Che Guevara, Ma Zedong. I found Richard. I kept telling him, I said, man, where's Huey at? And where does he live? He said, well, he lives back on 47th Street. It was Richard who got, gave me the address to where Huey was. And in effect, um, I went to Huey's house and I was telling Huey when I got a chance to see him, I hadn't seen him in a while because he had graduated from Mary College. Huey, Huey was in fact in Knight Law School at the time. But I said, well, Huey, we need to start a new organization. And so Richard was connected with that, getting me to know, find Huey. Well, in the context of when the Black Panther Party started in 1966, there had been for the last 20 years a freedom movement, a movement to end segregation, to end all kinds of humiliation, to end police violence, to end economic exploitation. So the freedom movement was underway when the Black Panther Party came into being. And I would say what the Black Panther Party focused on was more self-determination. The uh, party was established uh, basically as a, uh, a self-defense organization, I might say. Uh, but we had political uh, ideas and so forth because we met very young as students. In the 10-point program, one point calls for full employment, another point calls for decent housing, another point calls for decent education that taught us about our true history, another point calls for preventative medical health care, another point calls for fair treatment in the courts, you know what I mean, and juries of our peers and so on, etc. Then that was point number seven that calls for um, immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people in our black community. What we want. Well, the collateral point of what we believe on point number seven says we believe we have a right to defend ourselves from any racist attacks from anybody who would attack us, including the police. You see what I'm getting at? So that point evolved out of being there watching uh, policemen ordered to brutalize peaceful demonstrators who were exercising the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America. Well, that wasn't the only example we knew of. We heard about all down south, how peaceful protests had been brutalized there, uh, dogs, uh, cattle prods, etc. some killed and some shot and murdered for exercising their First Amendment Constitution right to peacefully redress grievances, to peacefully organize people, to register to vote down south. Pe young white and black civil rights worker were shot, killed, and murdered. So we're saying no. You know, so here we are, by the time we create the Black Panther Party, we inject into our this, this, this 10 point program. And remember, this 10 point program is similar to most civil rights pro programs. But we inject in that the right to self defense. And that is the crux of where we came from. All power to the people is becoming a reality because the people have come out here to stand for hours. We came out of the black power movement. Our first point in our program says, we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our own black community. So that tells you that this is a freedom to be in charge of your own life. It's also called self-determination. It's also 
called the end to external domination. We looked upon the way the blacks in the United States were being controlled and exploited and humiliated as a form of domestic colonialism. And so what we were about was liberating people from that colonialism. And that was the type of freedom we're talking about. Uh, very clear change in the economic, political, and social relationship of blacks in the United States to the government and to the resources. And Huey and Bobby and them came up with the 10-point platform and program and uh, said, this is our platform, our program, this differentiates us from all these steady groups of people that sit around and talk about the stuff they read in books and philosophize, this is our, uh, one of our plans of action. Well, we wrote the 10-point platform and program at the Warm Poverty Office, 55th and Market Street, finally completed it. And we made a beeline to Rich's house. We'd always jumping up to Rich's house. And that's what we used to do, you know, and talk and rap about the struggles, what have you said. But these are the days before the party really started. But we brought this 10-point program, and we didn't even have a name for it yet. We didn't have no Black Panther Party name for this 10-point program. And showed it to Richard and asked him what he thought. Richard thought it was fantastic. When they formed the Black Panther Party, I said, uh, Huey, uh, I know, you know, everybody in the hood thinks you and Bobby are crazy. And he was just, look, uh, Richard, uh, you have to let us have some of those guns. You have a lot of guns here. And you know, Richard said, but you can't have a gun. You, 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 you're, you're, you're on probation, etc." And he was says, no, I call my probation officer. And uh, no, he would say, I will call my probation officer. And that's what he did. And his probation officer says, you can have a rifle, but you can't have a handgun. So he gave an M1 carbine and a 45, and it was all about us, we were going to patrol the police. He said, but you guys are going to get your goddamn asses killed out here. And he said, well, we got to take the chance. Blah, 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 blah. When we first started, we had a police alert patrol, and uh, we would uh, patrol the community. We, if we saw the police uh, brutalize anyone, we would put an end to this. Usually the police wouldn't brutalize anyone if we were on hand because we were arrested the individual, we would follow him to the jail and bail the individual out, uh, whether he was a panther or not. And we would gain many recruits like this. So Therefore, the community started to, uh, to, uh, to say that, well, these people are really concerned about our welfare. When Bobby and Huey and uh, um, Albert started the Black Panther Party, uh, I was asked to join. I looked at them and asked them, besides being crazy, are you guys colorblind? I'm not black. <laughs> but Huey said in his high-pitched voice, I know you're not black. We're not asking you to join anyway because the struggle for freedom, justice, and equality transcends racial and ethnic boundaries. Oh, I told him. Little did I know what I would get into. He was a friend of Huey Newton. There wasn't an organization that he becomes a member of. It's an organization that he helps get started. This is what people... Now they see Black Panthers after the fact that they've already had an organization. But when I came to uh, California and met the Black Panthers, it was just a very small community group. Uh, for Richard, it wasn't even a group. It was his friends that he worked with. And so it gave rise. These are the people who have created the organization. There's a huge difference in creating an organization and joining the organization. So. What you should say was, why would he want to stimulate this kind of organization? What, what is he, he sees what he'd seen in his life, people being subjected to unfair, racist domination by the state. And that's wrong. And he knew it was wrong. And so he was quite willing to help his friends fight against this. <laughs> I remember when she joined, man, that was a crisis for me. She said, can I join? I had looked at her and I said, because her older brother John had joined and she got the call, you know, and I said, uh, 
it ain't up to me. That's a decision that I'm not authorized to approve or disapprove. So I actually was opposed because my thing was Black Panther Party for self-defense. It's a man's job. And we're not allowing no girls into the, the group. But Bobby and Huey were in the back. And I said, well, they're here. They're the ones that make the decision. Go ask them. So I learned something that day that uh, gender is, is not the yeah. criteria for that type of work. See, it's in the process of the struggle. A lot of times you learn stuff that you don't learn in the books, you know, and you got to kind of play it by ear and see how it pans out. And having women in the party was the best thing for the party on that issue. And the sad thing is, one of the major criticisms of the Black Panthers were the way was the way allegedly women Panthers were treated. But at least they were treated. If you look at the other groups in the 60s, they didn't have women in their group or they didn't have women in leadership roles. So the party kind of paved the way for women's lib in a way. When I saw Kathleen in that poster with the shotgun, I said, yeah, <laughs> you've come a long way, baby. Yeah. It wasn't the Virginia Slams that did it. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Uh, little Bobby Hutton, uh, Bobby Seals, Huey Newton, uh, myself, uh, the Forte brothers come around, cause, uh, uh, and Richard, I met Richard. Uh, uh, we were somewhere, uh, me, I remember me and Bobby uh, Seal were somewhere, and he said, man, we got, we were waiting for Richard, Richard coming, Richard's coming over, Richard's coming over, and I was wondering myself, who is Richard, you know, and, uh, and I guess we were out on the street corner somewhere, and here come Richard, bopping along, had on his uh, beret, and packing, big 357 Magnum on his hip. Uh, this little guy gonna break a hip with this big gun on to myself. <laughs> so um, Richard, we gave, gave us those guns and then we called up Richard and told him we had an office. He says, you got an office? So I, I guess Richard saw us really moving up now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Richard came down and then Richard helped us teach the other brothers, the new young seven, eight, ten brothers in there, how to break these weapons down, how to clean the weapons. Me, myself, Richard Aoki, and uh, big man Albert Howard who joined the party. Big man Albert Howard is ex-military too. I had been formerly in the military myself. So I, I could break down an M1 carbine blindfolded and put it back together. But it was Richard, really, with all the different array of weapons, 44, 44 pistols, 38 pistols, and other guns that he brought. He brought three or four more guns down. Besides the first two weapons, he brought one, two, three, four. Then I think uh, Richard had him a big 357 Magnum, a, a Magnum-style pistol that he, 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 he started donning. But I guess Richard looked around and saw us patrolling these police and says, how are you guys getting away with this shit? You know what I mean? Richard would come around and uh, donate weapons to the organization, you know. And uh, I never knew where his line of supply was coming from. Richard always had some, some equipment, as we used to call it. And Richard was, uh, you know, I mean, he was just 100%. Uh, decided on uh, on being a part of the, of, the, of the Black Panther Party. You know, I mean, there was no doubt <laughs> or anything about him. He was going to be a part of this. And uh, we would uh, have, like I say, have classes or uh, classes or sessions uh, in different places. You know, Richard when he was. Uh, had time or whatever, he would show up, you know, and be part of the study group or whatever, and kick ideas around about things that, you know, we wanted to do. And, uh, and talking about uh, armed struggle and, and that, he had no qualms about that. 
Like I said, when I first met him, he he was armed to the gills. Huey made me a field marshal, and so I used to drill the troops right there on the tennis court. And one day I was out there chanting, P-38 will set it straight, 45 will stop that jive, and 357 will send them to heaven. Huey was appalled. He pulled me back. I'm not thinking about revoking your commission. But he understood. He understood that all of this wouldn't come about peacefully. You have to be committed when you're training just as, because training is preparing you for battle. Years later, that came in handy in the few firefight experiences I had. I didn't have time to think about things. It just came automatically. I first heard about Richard, I was still in prison. I was in, uh, I think I was in Max B in San Quentin. And some of the comrades on the tier were talking about um, the Asian influence in the Panther Party. And at that time, I was, you know, I was come kind of dumb to the notion that there were Asians in the Panther Party, so I needed clarification. So uh, folks explained to me that um, there were several Japanese American um, Panthers, and one of them being Richard Aoki, uh, was a field marshal. If we're going to stand up to defend ourselves, we got to look good doing it. Now, there are people that talk about defense, but do they know how to defend? Can they handle the situation? It's remarkable nobody got killed in the Richmond demonstration. Nobody got killed on the shotgun patrol. Nobody got killed in the Sacramento incident. Think about it. Those were tight situations where discipline was important, but if the shit came down, it would have cost the other side a lot. And I think the other side knew it, because they knew we were training. They could, you know, they would pass by and we could see them looking out and saying things like, oh shit, them got guns now and they're training. And it was legal at that time, thanks to Huey's um, mastery of the laws regarding what we were doing as to what was legal, what wasn't legal. As Panthers would come in from the street, they would be talking about this guy, that uh, his drill sergeant that was, had him marching around doing slogans and you know, weapons training, and he was just like we were preparing for war, and, you know, and all this. And uh, it, was all, it was all favorable. You know, you had the grumbling about how hard he was on people, you know, but uh, beating people into shape and stuff. Now, Chaka's description, his hearsay <laughs> testimony could be true in a way because training is important. You don't have time to train when you're in the middle of a battle. You don't go like this if something needs to be kind of um, tweaked there on the field. You've got to go through this whole thing as if it's second nature, you know, to you. When I came into the party in early 1967, or actually it was late 1967, Richard Aoki was sort of a legendary person. We heard about Richard Ioki. We heard about the fact that he had been in concentration camps and that he had guns and that he had made guns available to Huey very early on. But I never actually saw him. He was kind of a mythic person. And so I got to see him, to know who he was many years later. I'm sure we actually were in the same place at some rallies, at some events, but he also had a very low profile. I'm yeah, your well, typical Orient. Yeah. I don't say too much. I don't make waves, you know. 
called, no, it's safer that way. It's safer that way, okay. Safer, yeah. If the man knew at the time I was a field marshal, they would have killed me. They would have killed me dead. That was too dangerous for consumption. I have, uh, on occasion, young people say, wasn't that exciting? I said, golly, you got a distorted picture of, yeah. <laughs> of the shit. <laughs> you were lucky, Richard. It was, you know, exciting. I said, I wasn't excited, man. I was scared shitless most no. of the time. <laughs> it was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but couldn't show it. Yeah. It's no fun having bullets whizzing <laughs> past your head in any, under any Real circumstances. Yeah. Ain't Real no video game. And at the same time, yes, we had the other programs, the breakfast programs, the free health clinic programs, the free shoe voter registration drive programs, the free food voter registration. We had all these programs, but we were always in a situation where we had to defend ourselves. And then finally, in 1969, J. Edgar Hoover at the helm. I mean, we read Freedom of Information Act documents now of how they set up, how Hoover directed this district offices of the FBI to work with police departments to set up the attacks on our offices. They set up attacks on every Black Panther Party office in this country. You know, and at one point, at first, you know, party members says, we take the arrest, we take the arrest. But then, what did they do? They decided to come in shooting because their real intent was to, to terrorize us out of existence. That's what they were about. So we defended ourselves in that year of 1969. By the end of 1969, I have 28 people dead. Three or four of them just killed by undercover provocative agents in and around and about our organization. They went in shooting and murdered Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, December the 4th, 1969. In the earlier part of that year, they had provocateur agents operating to sh literally shoot and kill Bunchy Carter, who was the head of the Southern California branch of the Black Panther Party, and John Huggins, who was the Deputy Minister of Information down there in Southern California chapter of the Black Panther Party, and murdered them. And this is well documented. The headquarters of the Black Panther Party right here in Berkeley, this is the headquarters of the National Organization of the Black Panther Party, was up for attack by the Berkeley Police Department, because it was just outside of Oakland into the Berkeley. So we come to find out through this document that for two months they had been planning an attack on that Berkeley headquarters office. They had plans drawn up. Somebody had gotten, provocative agents in our organization had gotten all the rooms upstairs and all the rooms downstairs to our headquarters office. It's a two-story building the backyard layout plan, where people slept at, where the operating offices for the front room and downstairs were, etc. all this whole shit. The specifications was drawn out how they would come in and they would sh bust in and shoot people and downstairs and then shoot up through the ceilings up into the second floor. And they calculated 15 to 20 to be wounded and are killed. Guess what happened? A young white police officer who kept hearing about these plans stole the damn plans and gave them to our lawyer and we put them in the press. Now this is the government literally laying plans to come attack, kill, shoot, and murder us. This was an extension with the FBI and racist mentality of the police department with politicians who supported that crap, kind of crap, you know, setting up an operation to wipe us out, to terrorize us out of existence. So I say that the right to defend yourself in those, in those times was quite, was, was, was plausible. I mean, it, was, it just was. The repression that came down on the people of the 60s was horrendous. You had to have been around. I lost a lot of friends that were blown away for being in the movement, for just being in the movement. 68 and 69, I was going to a funeral almost every other week because somebody I knew had been killed. But that's the cost of liberty. Uh, you know, it sounds a little hard, but the gains of the 60s would not have come about 
if those sacrifices had not been made. And don't forget, we're living in the belly of the beast. So they're going to be the strongest where they are. And when they came back down hard on the movement in the 60s to destroy it, they almost did a good job. However, however, my personal position today is we didn't lose in the 60s. We just didn't finish the job. Being on this corner brings back so many memories of years that have gone by. I was a transfer student from Merritt College to UC Berkeley way back in 1966. Berkeley in the 60s was a time of upheaval. It was right after Mario Savio. Uh, free speech was very strong and certainly the Blacks were the most ahead at that time. They, were, they already had a black studies department at the university. Uh, the Chicanos were working on one. Asians, there weren't very many. There were just a few people. Asian Americans, uh, I guess you could say that they didn't really come together uh, as an or organized force until uh, 1968, uh, 1969, with the formation of uh, AAPA, Asian American Political Alliance. Many of the people who were active before the late 60s, before the Asian Ameri the contemporary Asian American movement really takes off, they worked in other, other movements because there was no kind of active Asian American struggle occurring. Um, there were some things happening and of course Asian Americans had been engaged in protest for decades, but in terms of kind of a nationwide qualitative shift in the amount of activity happening and at a national level. That really begins, as many people talk about, in the late 60s. In the summer of 1968, a number of Asian students banded together to form the Asian American Political Alliance. It was made up of Asian students who began to realize the racist nature of America. And it was the first Asian American group at the University of California that was not based on ethnicity. It was what we, I would call Pan-Asianism. APA was one of the first Pan-Asian organizations, and they're known for being the group, and its leader, Ichi, Yuji Ichioka, for coining the term Asian American. And so they really, for political and strategic reasons, brought together at the time, it was mostly Japanese and Chinese, but also some Filipinos and some Koreans and some other Asian groups, brought them together in an alliance and looked at the commonalities that they had. APA, I guess you could say, was an Asian American uh, political organization that was anti-racist, it was anti-imperialist, um, and it's, it, uh, supported you know the black liberation movement and it supported um, uh, movements of peoples of colors you know worldwide as well as within um, the united states the alliance was created around a couple ideas one that asians needed to be militant we're not going to be like jacl or the chinese democratic club okay we were going to take on real issues <clears throat> and we're not gonna be nice about it. <laughs> so I think that was uh, one of the first things. There was gonna be a militant organization. Two, we're gonna try and be Asian American to try and identify those common things that we have and help each other in our struggles. And then realize that as a group, you know, we have a lot of commonalities worldwide as well as in this country. So there's a lot of different individual elements within APA uh, that led to the formation of APA. And then you had Richard, you know, who was really different, <laughs> you know, in terms of not your typical uh, Asian American, not your typical Asian American uh, activist. My first impression was, uh, I thought he was a, a, a little bit odd looking, you know, <laughs> in terms of, you know, he had like an army shirt on and his hair was all, slicked back, and he, had, and he wore these real dark uh, uh, sunglasses. 
Richard himself, he provided one of those models for people. If you like, he was a mentor for many of the young Asian, uh, both Chinese and Japanese and Filipino males, as to how you're supposed to deal with the world. You know, you're going to sit down and let people beat you, or you're going to stand up and be counted. He would speak during rallies. And, you know, he would say, you know, I want to speak directly to my Asian brothers and sisters because you might not believe these guys, but, you know, you should believe me. And he goes, Dig, what are you thinking in ca on this campus? Are you just one of these guys who walks around here? Or are you thinking about what's going on in the world? What do you think this campus is for? Just for you to study or to actually interact with the world? You know, he says, there are people dying out there, and what are you doing? <laughs> and it was, he says, you know, I want to challenge you today to think about your life and where you're going to go. Thirty years ago, there was a student strike here at Berkeley called the Third World Liberation Front Strike, which brought in ethnic studies. How many of you are at the University of California students? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should appreciate the fact that the ethnic studies department was born out of struggle. The Third World Liberation Front actually began first at SF State during the fall semester of uh, 1968. And it was extended to UC Berkeley in terms of there was a formation of the Third World Liberation Front at UC Berkeley. The reason for the Third World Strike was the demand that there be uh, a Third World College here at the University of California centering on African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans. We, we wanted uh, our share of education, you know, control over our education. And we also wanted to break down this ivory tower relationship between campus and community, you know. And we, and we wanted um, our education to become relevant to improvement, you know, of the uh, conditions in the community. Richard is intensively involved in the struggle for ethnic studies at Berkeley. Richard was, uh, you know, always, how shall I say, trying to get people organized, to think in an orderly fashion, uh, not just be crazy militant or just be concentrating on whatever it is you're doing, you know, but you need to be aware. He's a prominent Asian American spokesperson for the Third World Liberation Front. He also becomes the chair of APA during the period of the strike. I should mention that the Asian movement at that time on campus was <laughs> about 20 people. <laughs> Not very many. 20 people, and you have to remember, there are over 6,000 Asians on campus at that time. And you ask, what were the other Asians doing? Well, they were all studying. One of the principles underlying the Third World Strike was that we, disparate as we were, racially and ethnically, we agreed on the uh, principle of respecting uh, one another. I guess you could say Richard, because of his um, early experience, was like a bridge that brought like the different uh, uh, racial groups together that were struggling at that time. You know, a, a, you know, a very positive thing in terms of he could speak to, to, to different groups of people and, and, and be understood, you know. Whereas, you know, maybe when APA was being formed in the beginning, you know, it said, okay, well, who's going to speak at this rally? You know, everybody turn around, look at each other, say, well, I don't want to do it, you do it. Okay, let's get Richard to do it. You know, he's like the most talkative guy there, you know. And that also put a lot of pressure on him, too, you know, in terms of seeing himself as being someone, as a, a spokesman for, for the Asians and all this stuff, you know. The Orientals needed a leader, and I realized I was the leader in the sense that um, I was crazy, <laughs> you're right, Ben. <laughs> there was a little bit of zaniness to my set, and so um, I quickly realized that the Asians are going to have to prove to the blacks and Latinos that we are bad. It helped when people like Alvin and others who had martial arts training 
were able to distinguish themselves on the field of battle because it then it made me look good, mm -hmm. you know. I remember the black and Latino leaders saying, what you got, Richard? I mean, we know you, but we don't know your people. During the strike, um, the police course went after our leadership. Uh, they figured that would be a good way to break up the strike. I mean, could you, can you imagine what self-respecting Japanese American attorney would take my case on? You know, I mean, I was guilty. Isn't that the way it goes? Well, you remember, Ken? If he was arrested, he's guilty. We know it. This is how actually Richard got arrested during the strike. Um, we were in front of Sather Gate. Behind me, the police came and beat Richard up and dragged him off to the uh, police station. And then later on, the police charged him with felonious assault on a police officer. So, of course, we went to court. My own mother was so glad that she had remarried because during the 60s I'd be on TV doing something there in Sproul Plaza and the police would come and drag me off and she could, you know, face the world and say, well, he's not my son, my last name is different. So, uh, you know, when your own mother, when your own mother disavows you, you know you're in trouble. Uh, our lawyer, who at that time was Ken Kawaichi, um, said, well, could I see the police officer who was, uh, who made the arrest, okay? And so this guy comes out and he asks him, well, how tall are you? He says, I'm six foot five. And how much do you weigh, sir? He goes, uh, 250 pounds. And so he said, oh, could you stand over here for a moment? So we had the officer stand up and then uh, we rolled out a chair. And he said, uh, Mr. Ryoki, could you please stand on top of the chair? And when he stood on top of the chair, he was still shorter than the police officer. And then he asked, uh, Mr. Aoki, how much do you weigh? Uh, 120 pounds. And then the, Ken asked the uh, judge, now can you imagine someone who's 120 pounds attacking this guy who's fully armed, has helmet on, you know, he's got shin guards on, and you know, he, he's got a baton. Is this possible at all? And so it was just so, it was a very, uh, <laughs> Funny sight. And uh, I remember in this one big case, uh, as the jury was deliberating, my attorney was chortling. <laughs> and I said, man, how come you making light of this? He <laughs> said, you're the first criminal case I've brought, I've taken all the way this oh, far. Oh, man. <laughs> That's when I thought, man, I better get the stepping oh, right man. now. Of course, Richard got off. You know, the, no one on the jury could believe that he had attacked the police officer. Believe it or not, this is a Third World Liberation Front strike newspaper from 1969 mm. showing three students at Berkeley who exemplified and symbolized the unity of the four groups that were involved in the strike. On the right is uh, Manuel Madman Delgado from East LA. In the center is Charles Downtown Brown from Compton. And to the left is this Richard the Hitman Aoki. The three of us were called the leaders. This is the leader of the Native Americans. There were four groups involved, and three of us represented three of the groups, and Lenata Means represented the Native Americans. But Lenata one upmanship us. She got on the front page of Ramparts Magazine six months later for leading uh, the occupation of Alcatraz Island by the Native Americans in 1970. So this is what we fought for, how we looked 30 years ago. We would line up in the morning and do our little thing here. Close down the gate. <laughs> the strike began first with informational picket line. There were two opposing views. One was the one that we should be, uh, you know, we should negotiate, we should be, uh, how should I say, peaceful. And then there was Richard. Richard who said, no, that peaceful way is only going to work so far because they're not going to get serious with you until you show that you're serious. When we went on strike, 
they sent the frat students to break up our strike line, and we whipped their butts all the way back up to fraternity row on the feet. Yeah. Then they sent in plain clothes officers, and we beat one up and took his gun away. Then they sent in the UCPD, the Renacop, and we beat their butts. And then they brought in the Alameda County Sheriff. And then it got to be a standstill. Um, there, there, there's probably a lot of things that I, I'm not too sure uh, about the statute of limitations. <laughs> it got ugly. You know, and then students realize that when you go against the system, you need to be serious. I mean, in the end, during that period, there are a lot of pitch battles. You know where pepper gas first came from? They experimented on UC students. This is a research institution. <laughs> now, this is kind of funny. This is a short Chinese girl, not very tall, and she had a big purse. And so these two guys tried to knock her down. She swung her purse once and hit this guy and the guy went bang. And I go, wow, that's a pretty heavy purse. I went over and asked the girl what she had in her purse. She opened it up. There were two bricks inside the purse. <laughs> and I think that's when the students began to realize that, hey, you need to be militant. We really felt like we were going to have revolution in a couple of years. Like by 1970, there was going to be revolution in the United States. I mean, we just felt it. We just knew it. And there was a sense of extreme urgency. It turned out to be the longest strike in the history of the University of California at Berkeley. It lasted for three months. We brought that university to a standstill. Well, you know, when you bring campus, when you bring police on the campus, they don't really care. They just start swinging everybody. And I think it made a big difference when the white students started getting whopped on to <laughs> And they realize, hey, they don't really care. You know, you're going, you know, the university doesn't like any of this kind of stuff. You're standing there, you're going to get hit too. And that's, I think, when the whole campus united around the leadership of the Third World uh, Liberation Front, uh, that they were able to actually halt the university. It was also the costliest strike in the history of the University of California. The University of California lost their largest lecture building. Wheeler Auditorium. In the middle of the strike, there was a mysterious fire and a five million dollar <laughs> renovation job had to be done. Uh, when the financial costs, I guess, for the university got big, then negotiations began. But all that took part in one semester. It's kind of hard to believe. We've conducted this, this thing on campus and it, it created a lot of havoc, and we were able to uh, force and pressure the system to come to terms, you know, in terms of establishing uh, Asian American studies, ethnic studies. One of the major intents of the Third World Strike was to set up an educational apparatus here on campus that would recycle, <laughs> that would return uh, students of color to their communities and that's where the uh, serve the people movement that sprung up behind the International Hotel a little bit later Ebaca and Oakland and other places got their start. And Richard was one of the first coordinators of the Asian American Studies program at Berkeley and at a certain point he decided to leave you know my original intent was to pick up my degree in social work and immediately go back and put it to work in the community, but being in Asian American studies um, sort of hindered me uh, from doing that. Well, we got our ethnic studies program. I was uh, Part, there were six graduate students that ran the first year, and then uh, the second year I was appointed chair. I held that for three years until a degree grant program was approved by the Academic Senate. And I went to where I really belong, to the community college system. I've been in that system for 20 years now. 
Uh, I've been a dean. I've been a faculty senate president. I have a list of academic to-dos. When there were students that were uh, needing scholarships in order, you know, often students of color, right, of, often students from working class backgrounds, first, you know, generation to be in college, right, from families, you know, poor families and so forth, immigrant families often, Richard was someone who would go to bat for them. He would try to get them scholarships. He would try to encourage them to take certain classes. He would encourage them to stay in school. So I think in those ways, that's how he, he was then carrying out his politics. You know, here's someone who was one of the first Asian Americans as part of the Black Panther Party, but was also part of the Third World Liberation Front um, and continued to organize. And here 30 years later, when the students decide they're gonna do a nonviolent fast, which isn't really something that Richard Aoki would teach. He was much more revolutionary, much more militant than that. This is something that was very pacifist, if you will, but he still supported it. You know, it may not have been his tactic, but I think his wisdom in understanding is that times have changed. This is not 1968 anymore. Not everybody's picking up the gun, at least not now. You know, you had movements all over the world where people were picking up the gun and were creating revolution. And so when these students back in 99 uh, organized a fast, he supported it and he was actually one of the advisors. And that to me was really important to see that. That here was an elder who was willing to listen to young people to support their struggle, even though they were doing it by different means. In the 60s, the quote was, you either part of the solution or part of the problem. Actually, in intervening years, we found out that's not completely true. Because if you do that, then there's only two solutions. Either you're for us or you're against us. Uh, some people are not really ready to make those kind of commitments. You need to provide people with uh, lots of avenues to work with. You cannot be, how shall I say, what we used to call the ultra leftists. Uh, you know, there's only one way to do things. It's our way. Otherwise, you're messed up. Uh, that's not true. There has to be many different ways to change things. And you have to fight on many different levels. He never sold out. He's still true to his beliefs. And I think for me that's really inspiring because we live in a real consumer culture where it's all about me, me, me. For him, it's always been about serving the people. And for that, I give him the utmost respect. He spoke in a class at UC Davis about the Third World Strike and the way in which they were organizing um, in the Bay Area at the time. It really blew away, I think, a lot of students at the time in our class because um, a lot of it's very easy for a lot of folks to be demoralized and not really feel as though anything you do or can do will make a difference. But I think having his presence in class was extremely powerful uh, as an elder, as somebody who had like a lived experience like that, and making those connections and speaking to us in such radical and like revolutionary terms to a certain extent in such a matter of fact way and really making it realistic and not something that's very actually very tangible. My brother Richard is one of those elders that's consistent, he's principled, um, not only does he do good work, he doesn't stop. Ever since I've known him, he's always is out there um, in the trenches, and I respect that. Uh, a lot of times, uh, one of the problems we have is we, we stop. We, we're, we're not consistent, so we'll get things going, and then we'll, we'll let them sit, and they'll waste away. Whereas there's certain ones of our elders that don't stop, and, and Richard is definitely somebody that fits that, uh, that criteria. When, when I see him, I see him at all like the like black African liberation events. And that's ill to me. A major divide in our communities and communities of color is that the divide between black, brown, yellow, and red folks, right? Particularly black folks and Asian folks. When I, I went to Skyline, at Sky, we used to have like race riots. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the black kids versus the Asian kids. You know what I'm saying? So, when I think of the brother, what really stands out to me, man, is um, a sight to the necessity of, of across the board, black, brown, red, and yellow folks like building together. As young people today, that you wonder where you'll be in 20, 30, 40 years, and to see him walking around still fighting the fight and still struggling and, and walking around and being the person and, that he always has been, um, it keeps us motivated to keep doing the same and to see him in the spaces that he still educates and still talks and still shares his experience to really um, empower our youth and other generations. He creates a continuity that I think is missing in the movement today. I think the connection between the two are, are vital. Um, I think elders bring to the table wisdom and experience. And 
the younger generation, the newer generation, we bring to the table new ideas. I would consider him kind of like, um, like my, um, I don't know, social justice mentor or whatever, because um, I, I felt I could relate to him because we came of a similar ethnic background, but then uh, also because he, we were both passionate about similar issues, and I felt like I learned a lot from him, just from him talking and, and um, going to some of the events he invited me to. Before, I guess you could say, the, the, the early Richard that I knew was someone who, who might say the most extremist things, you know, and expect other people to kind of take them up from there. Yeah. Well, what minority person in this country hasn't thought about taking out the United States at one time or another in their life, male or female? You know, whereas maybe now when he talks to people, he, he you know, he might be more, uh, I don't know if you can say tactful or whatever. I mean, he, he would express the same ideas, but he would try to explain things, you know, more like on their level, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, don't get me wrong, I believe we should have a military, but it should be the people's military. A military that acts to defend the people rather than to oppress the people like an occupying army, such as what's happening in Iraq right now. You hear all this stuff, oh, we're bringing democracy and freedom to those poor Iraqis. I don't see no gratitude on the part of those Iraqis. They're saying, wait a minute, we don't like this scenario, but uh, that's the nature of the beast. It's like one of the people that I listen to for advice, and um, our relationship has grown over maybe like the past 10 years, you know, uh, especially since the 30th year reunion where I came in contact with him, you know, on more, because at that time he was kind of like uh, winding down his professional career where he had more time. And after he retired, he really he really went full force out against the war and stuff like that as in support of um, political prisoners. So in organizing like our legacy, he's been very active in carrying forth uh, our legacy. He speaks at rallies. Uh, he goes around different colleges and speaks. Uh, he's a very sought after speaker, you know, because of his experiences in, uh, in the party. Hey, Frank. Hey, right on. Good to see you. <laughs> Looking good. I'm here. I'm Tell here. me you had a little minor setback. You had a you know, you know, stroke, man? Yeah. Then well, broke my Frank. leg at the same time. Oh, man. <laughs> But I you feel like I'm it. almost on one. Yeah, Rick, look at but you look at We all look, we all getting up there, man. We hey, man, man grandparents way. now, yeah. brother. You know what I'm saying? See, you know when when the legacy was strong, man. I mean, you know what you still live. But when we was out and really moving and doing things, hey, brother, you know we were young men. Now we grandparents, so Tell you know what I'm saying. But brother, when the dust settled, though, we still. Oh yeah. yeah. Deal, deal, brother. We got quite a bit of mileage yeah. left. We got some mileage left on this, brother. Because there's gray up here, don't mean any fire down there. That's right. There's right. gray up, don't mean there's fire down there. Yeah, that's all the game. All power to right, the people. I don't feel old. Yeah, the cost of freedom is concrete. Bertel Brack once wrote in his play, The Measures Taken that a revolutionary is nothing but a blank page upon which history is written. And I feel like every word, every paragraph, every sentence is stamped on me uh, as a result of the struggles of the last 40 years. I have this tendency to spread myself thin and on political things. And that's been a real problem throughout my life. I, I just would ignore, you know, my personal health uh, for the cause. And I paid for it. So, um, in my old age, I'm getting more realistic or real pragmatic about pacing myself according to my abilities. And it's been difficult for me to reconcile 
my physical ailments um, along with the political tasks that need to be done but at least it's on my agenda as it whereas it wasn't that way before you don't, you don't want to get back in there? steps but Not I didn't expect cameras. that many taking pictures that was everybody awesome. and their mama was out down there the media frenzy there's probably several police officials I'm sure there were <clears throat> this anniversary is coming at this time because for because me, shit's coming down yeah yeah <laughs> tell me yeah yeah uh, I think it's, it's you know the time has never been more needy of a Panther Party type entity, you know, and uh, the mindset of the people involved in that to do something, you know, to come together on some kind of level. Now's the time for the Black Panther Party to come back yeah. because of the problems that exist. So yeah. it can't come back in the way it was. There's got to be a different uh, delivery uh, system. I haven't figured out the the answer but things are really moving along to the extent that people are ready yeah hey, what do you got? What do you got? 